Hello and welcome to this very, very special program. These are the times when I am glad I'm a journalist and an economist. I can't figure out actually journalist. <laughs> so don't, don't expect me to understand anything you say if you talk in economics. Raghuram Rajan, uh, in my opinion, and actually forget my opinion, globally recognized as the greatest Indian economist there is. There's Amartya Sen, of course, but after Amartya Sen, Raghuram Rajan. Uh, and the tragedy is that this country could not hold on to him. There's a long story behind, of it, behind that. Maybe we'll get some elements of what happened tonight, but it, was, it is a tragedy when a country can't hold on to somebody like Raghuram Rajan. But you'll be back one day. I'm back every few, few <laughs> months. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> but did you, do you miss India? Of course. I mean, look, I uh, enjoyed the time I spent here, and I try and get some of it back, meet friends, uh, talk to people every few months. Right, right, right. And while you're there, you keep watching NDTV, but don't, uh, don't tell us about that. Uh, you know? I read your news. <laughs> it's harder to watch TV. Right, uh, right, but on the on yeah. our app. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it's got over 200 million and a lot in America, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's doing well. However, it's not about uh, NDTV app, but it's a nice plug. Um, just go through the different issues. You're, you've written one book, you're about to write another. We won't go into your next book. Uh, and you've got together a panel of uh, economists, young like you, and they've really looked at detail at what's to be done for the Indian economy. Uh, I mean, it's great to see there's this direct interest in how to change things because things are pretty serious right now. Do we are we aware of how serious it is, or do, are we kind of glossing things over in this country? Well, I, I, I think we are in a situation where the cup is certainly half full. But that means it's also half empty. Yes. And I think as we go forward, the old models that worked are running out of steam, and we right. really need to think about what the new models are. Right. And unless we do that in real time, very quickly, mm -hmm. we're going to hit roadblocks. Uh, that's happening even as the world itself, after a period of very easy policy, is starting to turn around once again. So we had strong growth last year, growth is slowing this year, probably slow more next year. So the world environment is going to get a little more hostile. At the same time, I think we ourselves are going to to try and have to figure out new models. So this is a very interesting time. It's a challenging time. Right. Uh, it's not a time of crisis, certainly not yet. But we have to take this opportunity to do good things. I mean, if you wait for it till a crisis happens, it can be too late, right? Absolutely. And there are some elements that we shall go into that are a bit worrying, and we'd like to know what you think we should do about it. But just staying, starting with the broad picture and then coming down to India. The broad picture and its relevance to India uh, let's just have a look at the first issue we'd like to discuss, and that is India and the global backlash generally, which you've been talking about and writing about, and that is majoritarianism, which in, means exclusion rather than inclusion. And we see that with Donald Trump, we see that with Brexit, we see that with Erdogan. Uh, we are seeing a kind of a little bit of, it's maybe too strong to use the word hatred, but finding a common enemy and attacking either immigrants or Erdogan using the Muslim uh, Islamic mm -hmm. you know emotions to get mm -hmm. keep in power so if that majoritarianism is a wave in India eh, across the world is it coming affecting India as well well first it is affecting us because of the way other countries are seeing globalization right uh, today across the world globalization is seen as an elite project it's right. the guys who go to Davos, the guys who, um, you know, populate Washington or, or Paris, uh, who have benefited, uh, the people in the cities, the people with, you know, PhDs and master's degrees. And it's the common man, the yellow uh, vests in, in, um, France. in France, uh, or the uh, rural uh, worker in the United States who feel that they haven't benefited from this uh, tremendous uh, period of post-war growth. Now, in actual fact, they've come a long way, 
But uh, in the last few years, the sense of inequality has increased, especially post-global financial crisis. And there's a sense the policies those guys espouse are not policies for us. They want open borders for free trade. Free trade hits us. Now, these are people who are not looking at the cheaper consumer goods that they get. They're, getting, yeah. they're looking at the fact that their jobs are being threatened yeah, that's by the key. free the trade. Jobs are a key. Jobs problem. are key. And uh, similarly, as far as immigrants go, um, you know, they see the immigrants being let in and they say, oh, you're doing better because you now have a cheap nanny. But we're doing worse because we have competition for the nanny job, which right. we want. And at the same time, that nanny who doesn't speak uh, French or uh, English as uh, the country may be, sends her kids to the schools where our kids go. And the kids are, are uh, the schools aren't doing well because they have to cater to this wide variety of, uh, of children. Right. And so we don't like this. It's a uh, big change. It know? is. It is a sense that finally the masses are saying, you guys have built this wonderful fortress for yourself in these you know, really populous cities. And you're doing fantastically, but we're not. And but we it's need also true if you look at the, uh, the data, it's the, uh, say, the white men without degrees. Yeah. It's the... It's not just the masses. It's yeah. it is a say about 30, 40 percent, 30 percent who have not really, are not really well educated. Right? Well, and but it's not the bottom. Right. Uh, the ones who are most worried are the ones who enjoyed middle le uh, class status right, right. without having necessarily the educational background for the middle class. This is why they want the good uh, good jobs. These are guys with a high school degree who went to work in the Ford factory right. and got Ford level wages which were protected by strong unions. And now that Ford is closing down the plant or GM is closing down the plant, those jobs have gone. And then they're looking around for who to blame because we had these really good jobs paying $18, $20 an hour and we've got bummed down from that to essentially working in an Amazon warehouse where we service you know, yeah. uh, we fill the orders. Now, those are the lucky ones who got yeah. bumped down to Amazon. The unlucky ones during the Great Recession after went into disability because they really had no savings and they had to rely on disability insurance uh, right. to protect them because there's no job to be had in the area where the factory closed down. Right. So uh, the whole tech revolution is partly causing this problem. In fact, not only this, it's causing apparently the rift between China and uh, America. Well, absolutely. Uh, I think on the causing this problem, uh, most people look at um, you know trade as responsible for these jobs. Now, trade is responsible mm. for localized uh, sort of uh, factory closings, but if you look at the broader job losses, it is technology. It is technology which has put that uh, shop assistant out of work because now there's more online sales which are happening rather than in the shop. In fact, you know, uh, uh, we know that uh, at this point Amazon has a fully automated store. You walk in, yeah. you, you, know, you punch in your, your code, and then you go pick up anything you want and walk out. out and, and they've got these cameras basically looking at you and seeing what you Face pick up. Face recognition, everything. product recognition, product, everything. everything yeah. completely automated. And but think, still, um, you do have America growing at probably the fastest rate it's grown. The GDP is growing fast. Right. The unemployment rate is at its lowest. Yes. In fact, the black unemployment rate is also at its right. lowest. But there is something which, again, is common in yeah. America, England, uh, Europe. You need a common hit target to hit. Yeah. Why is that? Well, so one is the fear of the future. Uh, what right. they have yeah. is jobs, but not the jobs they would like to have. Right. It's, uh, they would like far better jobs, the old jobs that they had. Right. They feel themselves... So the unemployment figures are a bit um, misleading. A little misleading. Don't tell you the quality of jobs. Exactly, because they lost that Ford job, unionized Ford job, and they're now in the ununionized Amazon job, right. uh, which is quite different, if they're lucky again. If they're unlucky, they're uh, unemployed. Right. Uh, right. And, but also, it's not about just their jobs. They fear tremendously for their kids. The right. kids are not getting the kind of education they need. The kids are in danger, are, don't have the, the route 
uh, up through good schools into the mm -hmm. Ivy Leagues into great jobs. And so they're seeing the lack of mobility. And so they target immigrants or whatever. So, so how has this suddenly happened right across the West? Well, so I think the first thing that happened was, uh, I mean, the, the straw to some extent that broke the camel's back. This growing inequality uh, yes. as a result of technological change and increasing globalization has been there for the last 30 years. Yes. What changed, however, was the distrust in the elite. And for that, we had the global financial crisis where you know, all these bankers took us down a, a rat hole. And uh, at the end of it, none of them went to jail. Instead, what happened was Main Street uh, had tremendous amounts of unemployment. And even yes. though the banks were bailed out and the bankers soon went to earning bonuses, Main Street wasn't. That's right. the, that's that's the, the Now, it, it's gone from America to Europe and to some extent um, Turkey, and it's happening in India as well. Yeah. That there is discontent, there is this majoritarianism, yeah. there is a target community, a minority community, and there, here the job loss jobs are a serious problem. Right. So let's make the leap first from, from, uh, from this technological change, job losses, to, to the majoritarianism. Yes. I think one of the things that's happening uh, across the world is, okay, we've, we've lost these jobs. Who's responsible? It's not us. Uh, it's not that we didn't get you know, better education. And there's some truth to the fact that opportunities to get that education have diminished. But therefore, who's to blame? It's that those elite right. uh, sitting in Washington or New York who yes. are creating the rules for themselves at our expense, right? So there's a great amount of elite distrust. They took us through the financial crisis and it's bailed a themselves out. breakdown in trust. Exactly. And so that's an all fair. You don't trust Google. Google right. doesn't trust Facebook. Facebook doesn't trust Amazon. Yeah. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. It, yeah. It's broken down, yeah. right? And, and when it's broken down, then you have the entrepreneurial politician who says, look, look, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, don't trust them. I'm, I'm not one of them. I am the one of you. Yeah. I'm going to drain the swamp. I'm going to clean it up. And look, you know, the reason you're feeling this discomfort is your communities are breaking down. I feel your pain. I'm going to recreate this community. But so that community... your white community. It's going to be a community of people like us people who like really, us. you know, feel. I mean, those guys are the guys who favor the immigrants. They f favor women. They favor minorities. Right. Even we're transgenders, gonna, I mean, how... Yeah, uh, all these <laughs> new categories that come yeah. in, they're so inclusive that, in fact, they exclude us. Right. Uh, we're going to be inclusive to ourselves. Right. And so we're going to focus on creating an environment that is conducive to the growth of the true American. The, that's the nativist view, right. that we are the inheritors of, of the true nation. And I think... If of course, you we said do have Erdogan, the Indians there, right from the beginning. Anyway, that's it. No, the, the Erdogan, Indians, yeah. Indians there are outside the. They are totally out. They are outside the. Yeah, totally the, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The strange guys. Yeah. Um, uh, but but you can see that in country after country, right. that this majoritarianism uh, also is a uh, you know it's majoritarian nationalism. Yes, there is the a group which is the true national. And the rest are outsiders. And that's a way of uniting. That's exclusion. Yeah. By creating the outsider, right. you unite the insider because you're not yes. them. Yes, yes. It doesn't matter that, you know, there's a Polish American, there's an Italian American. Yes. The, I mean, these guys aren't, white is not a good uh, way of uniting. Yeah. But by saying they are so that you're not black, yeah. Yeah. you're not Hispanic. Asian, you're yeah. not Hispanic. Right. That's the way of uniting. It's the other that unites Absolutely. the Absolutely, and it's gone right across. Uh, 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 how is it affecting India as well? Well, I as mean, part my, of this my guess thing. is we're having this debate in this country also, right? Uh, and uh, the natural category is Hindu majoritarianism. Right. And then there's the excluded yes. from the Hindu majoritarianism, which is, which is uh, Christian, most, Muslim. many minorities, exactly, yeah. Hindus, I mean, Christians and Muslims. And, and the danger, of course, in this kind of uh, majoritarianism is that rather than uniting one set, it essentially divides the country into, into uh, right. you know, big uh, warring pieces. In fact, there's a, 
a, a simulation model done in many countries in California and in the university. It's kind of top secret. I can't mention which university, which puts India as the most likely to have civil war in the next three or four years. That is frightening. Violence. That is frightening. I I would not have thought us uh, there, but I, I do uh, worry about these tendencies because. You know, I mean, there was a syncretic view of the country earlier of coming together. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, Nehru is most associated with that. Yeah. But it seems to me that as a country with so many minorities, you cannot have any other structure for the country. It has to be a coming together, in a, an yeah. inclusive framework. I mean, you have 180 million Muslims. You have, uh, I don't know, 5, 10 million Christians and Sikhs and other minorities, it's not a small group. So right. if you're going to take them on, it is civil war. And yeah. that can kill an, kill an economy, right? Well, we've seen the example of Yugoslavia and other countries which had yeah. minorities that started, uh, you know, warring with each other. I mean, look, uh, to my mind, uh, a country like the United States uh, or like India, we have a constitution which... Uh, allows for a very civic nationalism that we are Indians if we subscribe to the set of values. Right. You don't have to be black, white, gray, whatever. You don't have to be this religion or that religion. You're subscribing to the ideals that are founding fathers, uh, yes. Ambedkar, uh, Nehru, uh, Ranjit Prasad, and so on, yeah. put together. And so in that sense, it seems to me that the way these large polyglot countries uh, with variety of minorities can survive going forward and be vibrant is really by adopting that framework as the raison d'etre for that for that country um, uh, a sort of uh, both a, a civic uh, sort of nationalism combined with a set of myths that we we sort of follow which we think is central to the core of who we are as a country right. and and I think a dialogue about what that is, is very well worth having. Right. But uh, that is what we should be aiming for, given that we already have this, else the dangers of, uh, of all these other Civil possibilities war. become and very, the, very the high. And the common thread of hate, hatred, actually, or exclusion, uh, which is an early form of hatred. Well, exclusion itself never is enough, right? Because right, you can't right. say that it's a benign outsider. No, no, you have to. Because after some time, the included set basically looks at each other and says, he's not like me, he's not like me, or she's not like me. Yeah. And so to unite them, you have to constantly refresh their concern about the other. Oh, this is going to happen, or those right. guys are plotting, or these things are happening. I mean, to some extent, that is the danger uh, that, that, that you have, that these, and these things are spread very quickly by uh, social media. The impact on the economy also, uh, in the in the long term, we would, I mean, the possibility of export-led growth because everybody's looking inwards now right. is much more difficult now. Right? Well, we've already seen the first uh, flushes of that uh, with what's happening in in the West, the uh, Trumpian anti-trade yeah. tirades. If it's America first, it means every trade agreement should be crafted in such a way that it favors America, and you know, uh, you can't do yeah. that for trade. There's a give and take, and so. Uh, the worry you're seeing with America first, uh, Turkey first, China first, etc., is it sets up confrontation. And yes. we've seen with what's happening in the China-U.S. confrontation, ultimately this is not about trade. I mean, so we uh, dismiss it as, you know, being minor and so on at our own risk because really this is the beginning of a 21st century uh, potential conflict. Uh, certainly, if you right. read Vice President Spencer's uh, address on October 4th, it is a declaration of war, effectively, a Cold War. The only thing that can pull back is if they uh, pull us back from this, is if both sides recognize the tremendous costs uh, in the short term to economies, in the longer terms, in terms of militarization. Uh, if they recognize that and pull back and say, okay, let us negotiate a settlement. 
Now, that settlement, there are various options there. For example, from the U.S.'s perspective, if China sort of is much more um, careful about the technologies it appropriates, steals, forces companies to divulge, that would be a major step forward for, for the U.S. because it fears that it will be overtaken by China in, in many of these key Technology. areas like artificial intelligence and, right. uh, and robotics. From China's perspective, if there's a sense that there is a global order where it is not bullied by the, the United States, which still has uh, a relative advantage in power, and it becomes part of the global sort of uh, order, the new global order, has some say in shaping it. It's not just the post-war order with the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO, yes. but they have some, some ability to shape it. That's a compromise, I think, that would be a viable one which would integrate them, the Chinese, and not make them follow other paths. But coming to India, and, uh, I want to just go on to our second point from uh, what I've read of what you've written and talked about. But they, like you mentioned that the, the all different kinds of whites in America, but they have a common enemy. In India, there are very many different kinds of Hindus. It's not like a Hindu is a uniform, homogeneous person. Upper caste in the north versus, say, a scheduled caste in the south. What's the... I mean, they're as diverse as Hindus and minorities, right? Uh, no, uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, to my mind, again, uh, what we need is a, a, a civic nationalism uh, which creates opportunity for, for everyone. So one other thing you've been talking about, and we look at that as our second point, this the kind of interplay between social issues and economic issues, that when you take on a social issue, you must you sometimes forget there's a social, uh, economic issue. For example, the whole question about cows and not to kill a cow, the impact on farmers' distress. Yeah. Because after a while, the cow has no terminal value. Right. After a while, the cow stops giving any milk. I mean, this is just an example. So the social issue, in fact, actually causes a lot of farmer distress because after a while, he just says, I don't need this cow anymore. It's just an expenditure. I can't right. sell it. Cows go out, they get um, disease, and the farmer loses more and more money. Um, but so social issues do have a huge economic impact as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to touch the cow issue. It's a very, very controversial issue. But l yeah. I think what, you, what you're suggesting is reflective of a larger problem. Uh, we take actions, right, without yeah. figuring out what the overall impact will be, which is much wider than the initial action we right, take, right? Right, exactly. That, in fact, uh, I mean, going back to the cow, cow, I said I won't touch it, but the you specific issue... You don't have to eat it, you, but you, as an economist... No, but that's but the, the point you made about, you know, what we need, if you really want to think about preserving the cow, is plenty of homes for the aged cow and the notion that this is going to cost fiscal resources, have the ability to do that, but also know up front that this makes the cow a less valuable asset in the hands of the farmer and see that you, you're compensating appropriately if you're changing the law in certain states from what it was before right. on the extent to which cows are protected. I mean, it's so sad to go around the villages which we've been doing for the last two months and seeing cows just abandoned now. Yeah, so, so in fact, that's, that's, I think the one difference between an economist and a layperson doing economics is the economist understands the general equilibrium consequences, that any action has a reaction. Right, the right. action of saying that sh you cannot, you know, um, sort of keep this, this uh, you cannot kill this cow, uh, requires uh, a reaction of having a whole lot of gaushalas, et cetera. That it's, costs a lot. Exactly. Cow just becomes a burden, and instead and, of and, and it's and so, so sad what, to what see that. What happens is if you don't have that, as you said, they get released on the street. So we need yeah. to think about all this all time, yeah. and how, if we are intent on protecting the cow, what kinds of structures we build up front, and, right. and who pays for it, and what the impact is on the ordinary farmer, because and, you know, and who the pays distress for it, right? Cause, because yeah. who pays for it? The, the, the incidence of the cost then falls in an unintended way yes. on the person you didn't want to affect. Right. The other thing we wanted to discuss with you, if you look at our third point, it's about global, what we learn from Lehman Brothers, what we learn from the crisis which you predicted. And uh, everybody says, what's your next prediction? There must be a lot of pressure. So like ILF 
IL and FS actually is called, versus Lehman Brothers. Is there any comparison and how bad is India's financial crisis? Uh, if we don't do anything, how bad are the NPAs? How bad is the bad debts? NPAs meaning non-performing assets, to make that clear, which are bad debts. Well, How uh, serious is it? It's, it's manageable still. Right. Uh, I don't think it's gone beyond the manageable. Uh, we were quite intent on trying to see the extent of the problem. I think we have largely uncovered the extent of the problem. I think when you were there, you said now you declare all your bad debts clearly. And right. it kind of tripled yeah. once people properly declared it. Thanks. Yeah. That was a great move. And even after declaring whether they declared everything or not, it seems there's still a gap of about 25%, but still. Well, I, I, I don't know about that because I, I'm not familiar with the supervisory structure right now, what, right, what right. they've discovered. But my sense was uh, where we are now is about what we thought there might be. Yes. Uh, a little less of course, time, things, yeah. uh, what happens is as time passes, the old bad debts age. Therefore, they, more of them have to be provisioned against and more of them have to be declared right. NPAs and right. so on. Right. But the, the reality is that if you're not forced uh, to recognize it, you don't act on it. Right. Uh, and right. you want to postpone the problem to the next guy. Right, uh, right. Because right. Let, let him or her take care of it on their watch because right. uh, it didn't happen on my watch. Yeah. So recognition to some extent is the first part of coming to terms with it. And some people say, oh, by recognizing you're, sh you're slowing the flow of credit. In fact, the flow of credit had already slowed way before the cleanup started. And that's what I, 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 we, you know, we presented in a set of charts, that public yes. sector banks had stopped lending way before relative to pub private sector banks. Early 2014, you see the chart coming down in terms of their credit growth. So you need to clean up in order to cre get credit going. Why is it important to get bank credit going? Because the alternative is the non-bank financial institutions pick up the slack. They're not as well regulated, they're not as well funded, and so we have a lot of non-bank financial institutions that expanded credit significantly in the last few years, funded with short-term debt. And these are the entities when ILFS goes, goes bust that get into trouble. Now, to some extent, we need to go back to the ILFS problem. I mean, ILFS was very serious, wasn't yeah. it? it? It really sh shook up uh, the financial community well, here. I, th I think the big issue there was uh, certainly the big shift in the ratings from being from AAA, AAA to D, D uh, very quickly. I mean, that's like Lehman Brothers. It takes yeah. us back to that sort of... We need to understand why. I, I do think that if you looked at bond prices, these guys were trading at pretty high spreads. So it seemed like the markets were recognizing that these yes. guys were risky, but somehow the rating agency wasn't. And then it's your recognition issue. You've got to recognize it, and then the rating agencies did right. and shook up the whole community. Right, right, because once the rating agencies changed, then people who invested just based on the rating without looking at the spread, and earlier saying, we're getting all these wide spreads for the AAA rating, Suddenly yeah. recognize that, you know, there's no free lunch. Yeah. Uh, the AAA spread, the widespread reflected the risk of the entity. I don't think this is our Lehman moment. Uh, not to say that no Lehman moment will come down the line. I do think that, you know, as time passes, we are sort of dealing with this problem. Right. But right. I, I think uh, for sure we really need to take a close look our, at our regulatory and supervisory structure with the view that we are picking up. Now, they, can, they cannot avoid making bad loans. The supervisory regulatory structure can't stop you from making bad loans because they don't have commercial uh, sort of uh, instincts. I mean, these are regulators. They, yeah. they could make good loans. They'd be in the banking <laughs> sector earning you know, high salaries. But what they can do is flag the bad right. loan when it happens yes. and start putting strictures on entities that make a right. lot of these right. loans. Right. And we need to look at whether we're doing that in sufficient time. Uh, so you're saying we're not quite at a layman a crash yet, but if we don't do anything, it could happen? I mean, the no, look, NBFCs are fragile? We, we need fragile? to continue cleaning up the banking system because I think restarting are bank we lending... Doing it? We, we are. I mean, there, there is this, uh, this stuff moving through the bankruptcy courts, but I've said repeatedly, the bankruptcy courts are not numerous enough and uh, strong enough. enough to handle the mass yeah. of NPS that have to be dealt with. 
So if we really want to make a dent in that, apart from these top 25 cases or 12 cases plus whatever is being referred, we really need to have out-of-court settlements for right. which the bankers have to be willing to make concessions when necessary and force the promoters to bring in money when necessary. And if the promoter is reluctant, then take them to bankruptcy court, which then speedily gives judgment saying, okay, right. uh, the promoter is, is, is stripped of, of the asset or right. whatever. Right. 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 We need these out-of-court settlements with the shadow of the bankruptcy court in case you don't reach an agreement. Yeah as the effective way to do the restructurings in most cases. Right. But Otherwise, we're not going to make a deal. going into the bankruptcy code and then it just takes years. It take, and it'll take long and longer because yeah. you'll clock up the bankruptcy yep. court. How many, how, much, how many judges do we have? How That's much time do they have? Yeah. Yeah. So what we need is a pushback, more restructuring, but that needs, for that you need to change the banker incentives. No banker wants to make concessions today for fear that CAG, CVC will pull him up. Or a phone call comes saying, oh, he's got any DJ. I don't know if that is the major concern right now, but I do think... Apparently, according to bankers, it is a worry. Well, yeah. uh, then crony, I'm out of it. I'm, I'm not, uh, but but I, I still think that uh, even barring uh, those issues, the, the issue of uh, well, being, being, um, being quite... Uh, willing to take losses where, because the problem is, if you actually do the right thing and cut down debt enough, right. that firm has the ability to grow. Yes. And when it grows, somebody will point a finger at you and say, why did you reduce debt by half? You yeah. could have collected all that money now. Yeah. Well, the truth is, if I left it at that level, I would have collected nothing. nothing. Yeah. Exactly, so at least I'm getting 50%. Now, the clever banker would put in some equity claims that he could then get some of the upside. Yes. So convert some right. bank debt into equity. These are equity. All standard procedures in These the West, which we're just not doing yet. And we have actually talent uh, in some me. of the, uh, you know, yeah. the, the, the entities that are here today that can structure all this. But yeah. bankers can do it. One of the things, in fact, talking about bad debts and huge uh, defaults, you, may, you sent a list to the government. What happened to that list? What was the what action was taken? Well, I I I I, I can just repeat what I said to the parliamentary committee. I'm Why can't unaware. You, say you can repeat more than <laughs> what you said. <laughs> I'm un unaware huh. of uh, where those those cases stand. Uh, no, the, when you sent this list, yeah, it had a list of names. Uh, it had a list of the largest frauds on the system. Now, right. be, let me be very careful. This is not. Uh, defaulter, uh, defaulter list, this was a list of frauds. frauds yes. And the reason I'm worried about frauds is if somebody gets away with impunity, then it incentivizes the next guy yeah, to yeah. defraud the system. Give me an example of a fraud person uh, on the me, list. Uh, well, I don't know. On the, I, 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 I don't mean, want to talk about the list. But, uh, a fraud is somebody who essentially illegally has, has taken money from the system. So, uh, modus operandi, jeweler, okay. uh, mm -hmm. without taking names. Yes. Jeweler uh, takes 4,000 crores of loans from the banking system, right. uh, has been doing reasonable job uh, repaying the loans, and then suddenly um, announces that his buyers on the other side have defaulted on him. Turns out all the buyers on the other side essentially consist of one firm, which is owned by the jeweler. My God. <laughs> right? And, and then you have to go after this and uncover the trail of money. Uh -huh. But by the time the fraud is de <clears throat> declared, some time has passed. So it's not easy. Uh, the no, and you pointed this out and nothing was done. I mean, it's no, no. a huge thing to, L to let point me put out. It this way, uh, our investigative agencies are at work. The problem is getting everybody together, moving forward, is a laborious task. But let me tell you, you write a letter. You're the uh, head of the RBI, and you send this letter. Shouldn't somebody come to you, spend a few days, and no, say, no. look, what is the issue? Can you tell me about this? Explain it and work fast no, no, on it. Did me, anybody come to you, let, let come me, back to you? Let me say this way. The mechanism of investigation was accelerated, put together, mm. etc. Mm. So my complaint is not about whether action was taken in response. Mm. My worry more is about the fact that we as a country cannot bring any of these guys back to face justice. 
Right. The fraudulent people. The fraudulent people. Which you're distinguishing from a defaulter. A defaulter whose business is different. Has gone and bad. I don't want to put default in the same class as fraud. Right. A defaulter may have bad luck. Yeah. And if you start putting defaulters in jail, you will have nobody taking any risk. We don't want that. Yeah. Uh, treat and we don't, we don't make that distinction somehow, we especially the to. media. We, <laughs> we, we must, because the fraud is, is a guy who deserves to be in jail. Like your buyer is you. I mean, that is yeah, like yeah, total yeah, fraud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Uh, and and the, the problem is if you don't put that guy in jail, uh, you know, more people get get the idea that maybe this we can do this. Right. That uh, I'm, I'm very glad you made this dis distinction between fraud and defaulters, and you made a list of fraudulent people, not just defaulters. Yeah. 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 And and saying that you know we created a fraud cell in the RBI both to get the bankers to recognize the frauds quickly. Longer the time it takes before they declare fraud, the more the the fraudster has. A time to cover his tracks, right? And the the other problem, of course, is that when the bankers declare a fraud, one of the temptations is to round up the bankers because they're the closest there. So I, I think right. we need to fix the problems in that system to make sure we catch them. Move on to our next broad issue and broad topic, and that is the attempted destruction of many of our institutions. We're finding, for example, this revising of GDP data. India's statistical service has been respected all over the world, unlike China's, for example. Now suddenly, they revise the data. What, what, do you, what is your sense about this? Look, I, I think revisions take place all the time. So I don't think there's anything uh, problematic about revisions. But what is important to maintain the credibility of our data system is to explain exactly what you did and put out the data that you used so that everything can be replicated and also the alternative choices. Now, we have the sense that GDP is this very, very carefully <laughs> determined number yeah. in which there's only one methodology. Yeah. The reality, <clears throat> of course, is it's a sausage that you most of us don't want to know how it's put together <laughs> right. because it's put together with many all kinds of assumptions, of thumb, yeah. all kinds of assumptions, extrapolations, factors, this, that, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so, uh, when you do that and when you revise it, it is really a complicated task for anybody to understand what you've done and also what alternatives you chose amongst the assumptions. It could well be that any revision is done innocuously by choosing, you know, between yeah. two, yeah. well, you choose. Yeah. But you have the duty to explain why each one of those was chosen and why it's better than the, the alternative. Right. I think. Uh, at this uh, point, given that we've got back, gone backwards and forwards, and the, given the controversies over these kinds of methodologies, I think it makes sense to have an independent outside board look at our statistical process, because I think there is real concern. And uh, to look at how this is, was revised? Uh, the entire process by right. which we calculate GDP. There are experts in there are other statistical agencies yeah. in yeah. other countries. Uh, call Open a it up. bunch of them to look yeah. at what we've done and give us a sense of, do you agree? What would you suggest? So do you feel it was not transparent enough and has it affected, to some extent, the credibility of our data? Look, I'm not an expert on, on GDP calculation. My sort of uh, sense from the people who are in the field mm. is that, you know, we really at this point have gone backwards and forwards. When you go backwards and forwards, we had one committee, the Sudipta Munle committee opining. We had another uh, sort of this thing. Some people said they didn't have the data. These guys <laughs> had the data. But look, ultimately, we have to have confidence. That's Not just confidence from the perspective of the outside investor, but many policymakers are m taking decisions based on these kinds of data. I don't really care about the past GDP, you know, that's gone. Hmm. But I do care about the yeah. coming GDP right. because and I'm going to make decisions on that yes. basis. Yes. So I need to have confidence in the integrity of that data. And I need to have confidence. And do you feel this kind of undermine that a little bit? Well, I, I think the backwards and forwards and the political controversy eventually, you know, outsiders don't know what's really going on. Right. And, um, you know, the temptation is to believe the worst. Yeah. Now, I think sensible, respectable people have said this is fine, 
and there are respectable people who say, you know, we're, if you look at the other stuff that's, that was going on at that time, it raises some questions. Mm -hmm. But I think the real need, in some sense, is to build credibility for our statistics. And, right. and I would say having an independent look at it is Never thought useful. the day would come where India would say we have to build credibility for our statistics. We were pretty good at that at the old day, but I, this sort I, of stuff I would, I, I would really... Not, I would not say that we're not still good at that, but I'd say there's enough controversy yeah. over it that is it makes sense sad, to get yeah. somebody to take a look at it who can, who's independent. Right. The, the, the next thing I wanted to discuss about uh, the worry about institutions, and that's not only, I mean, maybe it's accelerated recently, but destruction of our institutions over the years has happened. And that is, of course, the problem of the independence or the interference with the independence of the RBI. Uh, this hit the headlines. Um, I think you've also spoken about it. What would you have done in this situation? <laughs> Look, that's a hypothetical. It's, it's very hard to <laughs> I say. I only ask hypothetically. You're, you're, not, you're not in that position. You don't know all the parameters. You, you, I don't yeah. think it's... Uh, it's but they, the government, what did it want to do? It wanted to take over the so-called excess reserves of the RBI, right. Right. help its balance sheet or its budget, yeah and spend it on elections. Is that the basic underlying... Well, I, I don't know what, what the motivation is. I can explain the problem to you, yes. which is really that over the years, as uh, the, the RBI holds on its balance sheet foreign exchange reserves. I'm, I'm right. going to make it as simple as I can. Right. So this is not uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, comprehensive. So but please do that, yeah. RBI holds re foreign exchange reserves. Every time the rupee depreciates, the rupee value of RBI's assets go up. Right. The RBI has liabilities. What are those liabilities? Essentially, uh, reserves and the money it has printed. Okay, net of those take the assets, subtract the liabilities. Liabilities are in rupees. These are uh, assets are in dollars. When the dollar appreciates with, with, the, with the rupee, the assets go up in value. The liabilities stay the same, which means the RBI's equity goes up. Correct. Okay. Okay, so that's the... Uh, so basically the surplus or this uh, excess funds right. that the RBI has come because of a uh, lowering of the value of the rupee against the dollar. Effectively, much of it is that. Not all of it, no, but, but much most of, of it, it is that. that. So the more you devalue, the more the surplus would be. It seems really... Exactly. So, so then contra. the government basically says, well, you know, shouldn't you pay some of this to us? <laughs> and... I think the RBI has said, yes, we will pay you whatever we can of our profits, net of whatever we need to hold in terms of contingency reserves yes. for movements right. up and down, because the rupee that depreciated can also strengthen, in which case it goes the other way. So we should uh, uh, have accommodation for that. It's also said that, you know, we are a BAA country. We are a barely investment grade country. Sometimes... We need to take under international transactions, which require really high credit rating. For example, the swaps we did in, uh, in 2013. So for that, you need an unimpeachable balance sheet. Right? Why don't we keep the RBI as an unimpeachable balance sheet, a AAA credit rating? That requires a certain amount of equity. Now, net of the equity that's needed, the RBI can pay out a lot of it. There are three constraints on it. One, it has to be profits that it can be pay out. Uh, second, genuine profits. It yeah. has to be over and above what you need to retain to maintain that triple A uh, uh, credit rating. So if the government if it did that. something like this yeah. and gave a whole lot of its excess reserves yeah. to the government, it could affect the triple A rating, and that would be disastrous for the company. It could. It, it, it could. It depends on how much. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it may not be an issue now, but may be an issue yeah. when we but get into a tighter situation. it would make people think the balance sheet of the RBI is not too good. It, and it may at some point, right? Yeah. So that's that's one concern, and that's yes, something that's the government has to sit together with the RBI. Implications for the whole economy. If you has to figure out with down, sitting yeah. together with the RBI. But the other thing that people don't don't recognize, which is actually a funny aspect of monetary economics, is the RBI can print only so much money. So if today uh, the RBI makes, let's say, 70,000 crores in profits, but then you say you have an excess of another f you know, 1 lakh crores sitting on your balance sheet, pay that out to me, the problem is the RBI cannot monetize that additional 1 lakh crores and give it to the government just like that. Because 
there's only so much money the RBI can print without it becoming a problem down the line in terms of high inflation and so on. Yeah. So what the RBI will do is pay the 70,000 crores to the government, pay another 1 lakh crores to the government, but then it will sell government bonds from its balance sheet to withdraw that 1 lakh crores it has paid so that there's no excess liquidity in the market. But think about what's happening. What's happening is, on the one hand, it's giving you money. On the yeah. other hand, it's forcing the market to absor absorb one lakh crores worth of bonds, which essentially is forcing that on the market. Right. Net effect is, from the government's perspective, the amount of bonds the market has to absorb is the government's fiscal deficit, the old one, plus the one lakh crores that it thinks is, is sort of free. But it's not free. The public sector Absolutely. borrowing requirement has not changed. But so, tell me another thing that oh, you're saying it's to do with the rupee getting devalued it happens over 25 years yeah. so these excesses are 25 yeah. years yeah. why does it suddenly happen yeah. this request come or oh, this request comes all the time so six it's, months before it's, an election no <laughs> well to be fair I, yeah. I think the the pressure on the RBI to pay more dividends has been there for a f number you of years. you had it as well I had it as well and what did you tell them well so we paid uh, we had a committee actually I wrote a letter to the RBI when I was chief economic advisor uh -huh. saying uh, perhaps idea. the RBI should look at how much it needs to hold. Mm -hmm. When I came to the RBI as governor, I set up a committee under Mr. Maligam, very respected uh, right. uh, member of the board, who essentially said we have enough uh, capital to pay out our entire profit. The three years that I was governor, we paid the highest dividend in RBI's history to the government. Now, what the issue at stake is not that anymore. The issue is more than that. Not just the profit, they want the, what they call the excess. E exactly. And the Mulligan Committee opined that you cannot pay more than the profit. Yeah. Now, if there is a way around, there's one way of doing it, which is essentially take the capital of the RBI, reduce it by that one lakh crores, take the debt that the RBI holds of the government, write off one lakh crores of those bonds and say they're extinguished, they're paid by the government. Net effect, Government effectively gets the one lakh crore, but not as a flow. Not as so a cash. So it can't show it so as stop. a budgetary inflow. Right, right. It's that the government of India has less debt. Right. Now, uh, that doesn't seem to be a popular solution. No, they want the cash, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to uh, another issue, which is about the interference with institutions, like with the RBI. Uh, that is what's happening, the interference in the CBI. You know, it's a mess, the enforcement directorate. A lot of people are saying that, and I, I don't, uh, say, uh, accusing that the same thing's happening with SEBI, it's happening with RBI as we just discussed. What impact does that have on uh, global, because I, I'll give you an example. The major uh, media chain in, in America, I won't name them, was talking to us and said, you know, we love, uh, and we love India and we love you, but we will never tie up with you. So we said, why? He said, uh, because of what's happening in India. We said, what? You're fighting Trump every day. You're slamming him. And he said, you know what? He's a top guy in a big media company. You know what? Trump can tweet against us. He can stop inviting us to press conferences. He will never file a false case against us. If we come to India, that's what will happen to us. So this sort of interference has an impact on slowing down investment. People don't want to risk coming to India. It's not just a, it has more, it has an impact on the economy is what I'm trying to say. No, look, I, I don't know enough about the controversy with the CBI and so on, so I don't want to opine on that. Right. But I think the, uh, both, not just foreign investors, but for the domestic investor to have confidence, there has to be a sense that the rule, rule of law will be upheld, that, you know, uh, tax authorities will behave appropriately and that to some extent, uh, and this is the point I've made before, that India is very well positioned for growth from middle income onwards. We haven't got there yet, right. but once we get to middle income, we can grow because we are a democracy. We can speak our mind. We can have faith in the yes. institutions because they're protected right. by our democracy. Right. That if some uh, government leans too much on those institutions, we hope that the well-thinking people of India will come to the aid of those institutions. Right. So, to my mind, we are in a great spot as far as that growth goes once we reach there. 
And I've said before, it seems that we shouldn't be protecting those institutions because we will need them. And we're not protecting them right now. Well, we are under I mean, I, I think we're, we're, we're sort of, uh, at this point, engaged in debate about that, which is very good. And, right. and I hope we end up I protecting those I wish we didn't have to have that debate and they didn't need to. Now, a set of quick fire, just one kind of uh, sentence or one para answers because we'll go quickly through them. This is to do with India's economic and financial crisis. Is there one and how bad it is? One, how bad is the bad loans and the big defaulters problem? I think we can fix it. We need to uh, you know, work with greater urgency, but it's not unfixable. And the key is take haircuts, bank take haircuts, do out-of-court settlements and treat defaulters and fraudulent people differently. Is that what you, that's what you said? But I also think there's some trying to, on the working on the real side, power plants that are problematic, try and put them back on track. Right. Uh, some sense of urgency on, 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 on fixing the, the stressed, stranded assets. Uh, that is, has to be part of the solution. But that, uh, all these things have to be done together to some right. extent. Second uh, quick fire is uh, demonetization. Uh, what, what is it, a good idea or a bad idea? I think the net uh, impression is that uh, it had a significant effect on our growth. Uh, and now I'm seeing studies which reaffirm that. So it slowed down our growth. Remember, the world was growing faster in 2017. We slowed down. Right. That was the twin blow of demonetization and GST. And before anybody accuses me of being anti-GST, it's a good idea We're in the longer run. GST in a it's a good idea in the longer run, but it had the short-term teething effects. Let's look at GST. We'll bring that up. So demonetization, were you asked to actually do it as well at some point? No, no. I was asked my opinion about it, and I've said this publicly before. And, uh, and I, you I, said? I, I thought it was a bad you idea. You said go jump in the lake. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> you don't say that to the government of India. You say, uh, here are reasons why uh, it's, it's... There are many pros and cons, however. That's however, <laughs> yes. I mean. But you, you were asked and you said no. On GST, good idea, badly implemented? I, I, I think uh, it could have been implemented much better. It created disruption. Now, uh, again, the question is, is this all hindsight being 2020? Or was there a process by which we could have run it in parallel for a little while and then shifted to it? Right. Were we in too much of a hurry to and get to it? should we just have had one rate rather than these five rates uh, and everybody? Yeah, uh, so one can, bill has got six. We can debate this. Now, yeah. my, the, the, the alternative view, which is not entirely uh, a wrong one, is, look, in India, we first say, Chalo, let's go do it. Uh. Once you do it, you find out the problems, then you start fixing them one by one. So uh. this was inevitable. And there may be some truth to it. Right. The next issue is how bad is the no jobs issue, the lack of jobs? I think this is a very serious issue. I think this reflects the, the, the problems with our current paradigm, that even at 7% growth, um, I think it's whatever the number is, it's not producing the jobs. 25 million uh, people applying for 90,000 uh, railway jobs, and these aren't great railway 25 jobs. 25 million. 25 million applications for 90,000 railway jobs. And these are, you know, those track workers and so on. They, they actually have to work. And, and uh, you know, that seems to me a reflection of the fact that we really have a jobs mm -hmm. problem. And, of course, the farmer agitations and so on is partly because they're stuck in low-growth agriculture. Right. The next question, how serious is agricultural distress, agrarian distress? I think it's a huge problem. I think it's uh, uh, that power and banks are our three major... And jobs. Well, jobs are a reflection are, are of these. Are a reflection yeah. of these. Yeah. Uh, I think in agriculture, the paradigm we have today of a combination of minimum support prices and loan waiver simply is not creating the the basis for agriculture to flourish. Uh, we need to rethink what we, I mean, there are plenty of ideas in India around. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, certainly we need technological sort of enhancement of agriculture. Uh, we, 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 we need, need irrigation to, and to be done without need, corruption. We need irrigation. It's the area which they say is the wettest job yeah. in any uh, state government. We, but we have uh, essentially, a lot of arable land relative to China, for example. Right, yeah. If you could enhance productivity, we would have a substantial... We need to see agriculture not as an industry which needs subsidy, but as a growth engine for uh, India going forward. 
and for so that jobs, we need to do agrarian distress banks npas finally it's something uh, i read in your uh, in the paper you've written uh, the declining women's participation in the workforce it's yeah. grown down from 35% to 20 anyway 35% was low and it's now 27% uh, the the numbers are, are very worrisome in India because for most countries that are increasing in development, women join the labor force. And it's only yes. when it gets really developed that they start leaving. For us, they've started leaving very early. which And it's not as if they don't want to participate in the labor force. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think working at home is a honorable activity. Yeah. But many of them want mm. to leave the home and work outside. Yeah. And the fact is, we're not creating those opportunities for them. And certainly, uh, the statistics that it's falling rather than increasing, which and, is and natural. Part of it is also related to safety of women, etc. Safety of women. And just not opportunities. And also, the, sometimes the status issues, when you grow in status, you pull your women out from the fields back into the home. So there's some natural yeah. thing. But I think but also, to, yeah. there are women who want to work outside who and aren't this given could that opportunity. Be completely revolutionary in terms of our growth rate because if women contribute from zero to whatever they contribute be yeah. a huge difference right? it will make and of course we need to take that people will have to do the work that they're currently doing uh, at home it will monetize some of those I must jobs. tell you one bit of good yeah. uh, good development of women women's turnout in elections is higher than men now <laughs> it used to be 20 percent behind men yeah. just three decades yeah. ago you know men would be 60 right. or 55 and they'd be 35 yeah. Now it's 70 and women 72. No, and also the various political parties, you know, giving bicycles to women, yes. uh, to yes. girls, so that they can go to school. I think there are lots of ideas out there which women are Women come out and vote, they realize I better look yeah. after them. Exactly, exactly. And Eventually, think... all of you uh, intellectuals, we have faith in the voter, right? You also have faith in the Indian voter, am Absolutely. I right? Absolutely. Forget the politicians, forget the bureaucrats, it's the voter which pushes everybody. There's a logic to, you know, when you look at the aggregate, there's a logic that emerges, which is, you know, thus far I haven't had cause to argue with that logic. Right, right. Thank God for Indians, India's democracy. Thank you very much, Raghuram Raja. Thank you.